be only one button. Hold on. So which one is it just the okay button or I assume it's okay. We're going to try that. Oh, yeah. It is. Okay. All right. <laughs> So welcome to the spring semester. Clearly, you can see there's no heat in the room. The remotes don't work, but we'll all figure that out. <laughs> all right, so welcome to 577. This is a new class. Uh, well, actually not really new. It hasn't been taught for 13 years. So really, at some <laughs> level, it is new. Uh, but we redid re the course completely. So effectively, it's new. It's never been taught before. So uh, hopefully, uh, I'll talk about what the course is about, but hopefully you'll have a good experience uh, over the course of the semester. Class is more or less full, as you can see, most seats are taken. Uh, so if you haven't registered for the class, come see me at the end of the class, because I see people standing, which means there are some people who have not yet registered who are here, because there's only as many seats as people who are in the class, but we'll figure all that out. So my name is Prashant Chino. I am the instructor for this course. I teach the uh, other operating systems classes here as well. The undergrad OS 377, which I haven't taught for some time, but I also teach 677, which is the graduate version of operating system. This course actually sits somewhere in between the two. Okay. So what I'll do today is uh, basically it's an organizational introductory class where I'm going to talk about the logistics for the class. I'll also discuss uh, very briefly what this course is about, what you should expect from this class and so on. Okay. So let's start with some organizational resources. So the most important resource you need to know is the course web page. Uh, which you can actually go to my web page and there's a link to the course web page. Practically everything else you can actually find from the course web page. Okay? So I will post uh, lecture notes, which are the slides I'm presenting here. Presumably every class we are going to have a volunteer take notes for the entire class and then we'll post those notes as well. Okay? You'll see that we are recording the class. That's just on a best effort basis. All the lecture videos are actually going to be posted as well for later review. Okay? That's not a reason to not come to class. You should come because there's more you can do by discussing and asking questions in the class. Okay? So, so that's going to be the YouTube channel. We are going to use uh, GitHub Classroom for all the programming assignments. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. And you probably all know about Piazza, which is our online discussions forum, which is what we are going to use for this class as well. Okay? So there are two other core staff members that you need to know. Uh, Ahmed, who's actually in the back, he's, uh, he's going to be the backup instructor. There will be occasionally topics where he is better equipped to talk about those topics than even I am. I'm going to have him come talk ab about some of those. By and large, I'll be the primary instructor. I'll do most of the lectures, but he's going to cover a few lectures at least. And there's the TA, Walid. Uh, actually, he's not here, so I put his picture up there, so you can actually associate uh, a face with the name. So he's going to be the TA for the class. He's the primary resource for lab assignments, whenever you have any trouble, he is the first person you go to. If that doesn't uh, help you, then come to me. I'm of course av available to help at any point, but he is especially equipped to help you with all the lab work and whatnot. Okay? All right. So just some qu quick prerequisites so that you all know what is expected of you coming in. I'll also tell you what you should expect going out of this class at the end of the semester. Okay? So coming in, we assume that you have a background in operating system. This is the second course in operating system. So there's an assumption that you know something about operating systems already, okay? which is an undergrad level course. We have not done any prereq checking whatsoever. So it's really up to you to be responsible for knowing that material. If you haven't taken that class or you've forgotten all the concepts, you have material that you can use to catch up should you decide to take this class anyway. Okay, so there's an undergrad textbook that we now use in the 377, that's the undergrad OS class. It's free textbook. Okay, so you can actually go get that book and have it as a reference. You can brush up your knowledge and whatnot. And uh, 
if you want to actually go back and review lecture videos, the videos for, from my teaching of that undergrad course are also available on our same YouTube channel that this class videos are going to be posted. Feel free to review the, those uh, material as well, should you feel like you need some refresher. Okay? I will provide some background every time I introduce a new topic in this course, just so that we have a recap. But I think the general expectation is you should be knowing that stuff already. Okay? Now, that's the first prereq. The second one is that uh, you need to have some knowledge of C programming. Okay, not Python, not Java, C. That's because all operating systems are written in C. So all our programming assignments are actually going to be in C as a result. Okay? If you know C++, I think you kind of know C already. Okay, if you never use C++ or C, you are expected and you want to still be in this class, you are going to be expected to catch up on knowledge of C programming. Okay, there are plenty of books that you can use. It's not hard to learn a new language, but the expectation is you know it going in. Okay, the first assignment, which is going to be an ungraded assignment, is going to be just some C programming. Okay, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, we will provide you help. Okay, but the expectation is you can learn quickly and bring yourself up to speed, so you can actually get something from the actual assignments that will follow. Is that clear? Right. Here, uh, who is among all of you has actually used C, C++ or know it reasonably now? Okay, practically most of you. Okay, and if you haven't, you want to understand what the level of programming uh, knowledge you need, come talk to me. Okay? But if you are going to be taking this class, the assumption is you will actually know something about undergrad operating systems and know something about C programming. Those are the two things to keep in mind. All right. So as far as grading is concerned, its majority of the grade is going to be actually on hands-on work. There will be lectures uh, where I will talk about the concepts okay, and then introduce you to what you need to learn and then you go off and do some programming assignments. So half the grade is going to be actually on the programming assignments. Another 25 percent of the grade is going to be on a project, which is essentially an extended programming assignment that you will do towards the end of the course. Okay, so, three quarters of the grade is basically all, all hands on programming work. Okay, and then we have 20 percent of the grade on a midterm exam. It's no finals. Okay, so, no final exam to worry about. Okay, but there will be a midterm early March, okay, just before the spring break. We are going to that week, we are going to schedule a midterm exam. I okay. will announce the date shortly. I need to get a classroom for it before I actually put the date up. Okay. But the week before me, uh, swing break is when we have the midterm. There is no final exam. Okay. And then 5 percent class participation. Okay. The assumption is that this is going to be a very interactive class where you ask questions. Okay. I am not going to stand here and lecture for one and a half hours and you just listen. Okay. The assumption is you will ask lots of questions because that is the best way you are going to learn the topic. Okay. And of course, you can take that uh, on the Piazza sessions and have questions there as well and answer other people's questions. So, we will take all that into account as class participation. Okay. So, that is how the grading is going to be done. As far as the textbook is concerned, there is no real textbook for this course. The only suggested book is to actually uh, see if you want to uh, have access to a copy of Tannenbaum's Operating System Design and Implementation book, third edition. That is called also called the Minix book. Some of the earlier programming assignments are going to be derived from Minix. So, having uh, access to that book it would be useful. It is actually a very expensive book to buy. So, there is no requirement that you should buy it. I, I assume that there will be a copy in the library. I will try to put it on reserve. I might have a copy uh, that I can give to the TA, so you can use it as a reference during office hours or whatever you want. You can also find copies on the web if you really go looking for one, okay? but that is up to you whether you want to do that. Okay? And uh, there will be other course material that I will post online as well, which will be papers and access to technical documentation of operating systems and things of that sort. Okay? Any questions on any of this? Okay. So, um, as far as uh, other requirements are concerned, the assumption is you have access to a laptop or a desktop to do your programming work. Okay. We will give you access to EdLab machines, but really the, the kinds of assignments that we do, it is really useful to have access to your own machine. Okay. 
So, we will assume that we will access give you access to the ed lab. Okay, we also have office hours, mine are going to be uh, on Thursdays right before the class lecture. I am going to have a second slot which I have not yet decided what that is, but Thursdays before class I am going to have uh, office hours. Uh, we will also announce TA office hours shortly. Okay, we have to get access to a room and then we can announce it. But, but three of at least three days of the week, if not four days of the week, you will have access to someone to talk to if you have any problems. Okay. So, I already mentioned this, but let me repeat. So, most of the grades since it is going to be focused on uh, hands on labs, programming assignments and project. So, we will have 5 or 6, I think it is going to be 5, but we might do a 6th one. Okay. So, which are going to be shorter. Okay. So, you basically every 2 weeks or so, you are going to have an assignment. There is going to be a project. Okay. All of it is going to use C. Yes, we have a question. Do we need to know any SMS? That is a good uh, good question. So, this is a course on operating system. Typically, if you go really deep into the OS kernel, you will see that some very basic parts of it are written in assembly code. Okay? As far as this course is concerned, there is no requirement you know any assembly. There will be no assembly programming for sure, okay? but if you have actually taken architecture or anything like that, if you have that knowledge, it might be helpful if you are actually looking at some code or debugging something, but there is no requirement. C is all you need, really need to know. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So, uh, assignments will use C. We are going to use GitHub Classroom to do all of the work. Has anyone here used GitHub Classroom in other courses? Okay, most of you use it. So, you know how it, well, if you used GitHub, it is not very different from using GitHub in general, but this is a classroom version of GitHub and we are going to use that. Okay, the first uh, task for all of you is to actually go to Moodle, where there is a questionnaire and the questionnaire asks you to actually provide your GitHub ID. Okay? That way, we can go into GitHub classroom and link you to your GitHub ID, so we know who you are, because all the work you turn into GitHub is through your GitHub ID. We need to know who you are in reality, not just what your GitHub ID. So, so be sure to go into Moodle. Okay? There is an assignment there. I think it is not yet live. We are going to make it live right after this class, but the assignment is already in there and all it asks you is just submit your GitHub ID. So, if you do not have a GitHub account, you obviously got to create one, but I am assuming most of you already have one. Okay. So, you got to tell us what your ID is. Okay. So, go read the academic honesty policy. I mean, we just follow university guidelines on what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Obviously, we encourage collaboration, but all the work that you turn in at the end of each assignment needs to be your own. Okay, so, you need to be clear on what you are allowed, what you are not allowed. If there is ever any question about this, come talk to me. Okay? Do not try to take somebody else's work, pass it off as your own, because it is very easy to detect these things and then it only causes grief for you at the end of the day. Okay. The more you put into this class, the better off you will be in terms of learning the material. Okay. So, a general reminder about cell phones, laptops and what not. So, obviously, cell phones you should not use in class at all. Okay. That is a given. So, when you come in, just turn your, your phones or put them in silent mode. As far as laptops are concerned, my general policy is no laptops in class either. Okay. So, you are not supposed to be sitting here and browsing the web when I am talking. Okay. That is distraction for people around you and so on. Okay. So, for most of the lectures, you will not be allowed to use laptops. If you want to take notes, I will post the class notes or the slides before the class. You can print it and take notes and what not, but there will be portions of the class where we are actually going to ask you to do things. Okay. And for those periods of the lectures, you will actually be allowed to use laptops. In fact, we will require you to use laptops. So, so bring your machine, but do not use it until we tell you, okay, go and do such and such things to set up something or download the first programming assignment and what not. Okay. This just makes for a better course uh, experience for everyone. Okay. Because if everyone has laptops open and they are looking at your machine and I am just talking, it does not make for a fun class at all. Okay. So, that is the general policy. So, keep that in mind. Every once in a while, I am going to remind you because after 4 or 5 weeks, you will start forgetting these things and you might start drifting off from the policy. Okay? So, that is uh, as far as logistics are concerned. Okay, now, I am going to talk a little bit about what this course is about, what you should expect to get out of it and do a very quick introduction to operating systems, the way we are going to look at it from the perspective of this class. 
Okay. So, needless to say, this is an advanced course on operating system. You, also, you should have learned the basics already or should know the basics already. Okay. The course is by and large going to focus on OS internals, which essentially means operating system kernels. Okay. And then I will talk about why this is even interesting to do. So, you are going to get an hands on exposure to operating systems by actually going and programming parts of it, modifying parts of it or doing something <coughs> with it that gives you a better exposure to how operating systems work at an in depth level. Okay. So, you might ask what, why should you take this course, what should you get out of it. So, I actually took the time to write down the out, the goals of this course and the outcomes of the course. So, there is a web link there from the that you can go to the from the course web page. It will list various objectives, what should you expect in the course from a technical perspective, from a professional perspective, if you expect to go get a job someday, how is this course going to help you from that regard and so on. Okay. Now, so those are the objectives of the course, but as far as learning outcomes are concerned, what do you expect going out of this course? I said, what are the prereqs or so what are the postrecs effectively, right? So, so you should at the end of this course know how to develop low level operating system code, okay? Not assembly code, I just mean all OS kernel code is low level effectively. So, you need to, you will learn how to program kernels, you will learn how to reason about performance and design trade offs. All systems programming essentially involves trade offs. Okay. Do you add more functionality and slow down your code? Okay. So, there is always a trade off, there is no right answer, but you got to understand what the trade offs are and what the right design decision is for whatever goal it is that you are trying to do. Okay. So, this course exposes you to that skill. Okay. That skill is not required just in operating system, it is a broad skill you can use in any software design. So, it is actually a skill that you will appreciate in many other contexts as well, although you are learning it in the context of operating systems. Okay. You will of course, be able to write code hopefully by the end of this course that targets a variety of environment, different operating systems. The concepts are very similar, but we will at least touch upon two operating systems in the, uh, during this course. One is going to be a small one called Minix. Okay, and then another one is Linux. Okay, so, we will basically do Minix programming and some Linux programming. Okay. So, that will give you exposure to two, two OS platforms. So, so, by extension that means you will basically be able to then adapt to other platforms as well, should you ever need to write OS code. Okay. You will understand how to use benchmarking and profiling tools. Okay, again, that is not an OS specific skill, you will learn it in this context, but you will be able to use it more broadly. Okay. And then last but not least, we will have some reading material for you. So, you will get some exposure to reading research papers. Okay. Some of you are here, uh, of, of your undergraduate may or may not have actually read a research paper ever. Okay. And the rest of your master student, maybe you read some papers, maybe you did not. You will read a few in this course. Okay. You will understand what research is, how people write papers, you will be able to critique it and so on. It is a good skill to learn when you read any technical material. Okay. So, these are all skills that you will learn. You will see that some of them are general skills, they are not OS specific at all and some of them are OS specific skills. Okay. So, that is what you should expect to get out of this course. And the good thing is the, since some of the learning outcomes are more broad based, you will be able to use it more widely. Okay. And the reason is that most of you will never ever outside of this class write any kernel code whatsoever. Okay, most of some of you might, but most of you will not. Okay, because the number of kernel programmers in the world might be a small dot, and then the number of software programmers are like this big bubble, right? So most people actually write application code, not even system code, and very few people actually touch the kernel at all. Okay, now so that seems like a very niche skill to learn. Okay, but it's still a very useful skill to learn because if you know how to program at that level you understand complex software system, you can apply it very broadly to variety of other things. So, the skills you will learn, although you may not actually apply it to do kernel programming, uh, you will be able to apply it in many, many other contexts. So, it is still a very useful course from that respect. Okay. And many of you may be here because you like operating system, which is great, okay. I do too, but some of you may be here just to learn these broader skills as well. Okay. So, that is learning outcomes and then we are going to talk a little bit about designing large scale systems. As I said, the skills that you will use in this class or learn in this class 
can apply to design of large scale systems, which as I said involve a lot of different trade offs. Okay. When you design any large software systems, you need to know things across the stack, you need to know what is at the hardware software interface, you need to know how things work from a design standpoint, uh, lots of interesting things like memory management, concurrency, things of that sort. So, you will get exposure to some of those things here. All right. So, with that I am going to now give you an introduction to operating systems. I am going to start with the list of topics we are going to cover in the next four, uh, 14 weeks or so. Okay. So, we will start with OS architecture and micro kernels. Okay. Micro kernels as you will see today are essentially very compact operating system kernels. They are very small, they are easier to learn and manage and what not. Okay. So, we will start with that okay. and then we will look at process management, memory management, uh, IO, file st uh, storage and file systems. Basically, these are the same concepts you should have already encountered in a undergrad OS class. Okay. Except that here we are going to go in depth and actually have programming assignments that require to go touch portions of the operating system that do all of those things. So, you will get a much better appreciation of whatever you learned already about operating systems. Okay. And then we will at least have some time at the end of the course for more advanced concepts which are virtualization, cluster scheduling, things like Docker, Kubernetes that you may have heard of. That is just to show how operating systems can be used in the larger context. Okay. And as I already said, this course essentially sits between an undergrad OS class and a full left blown graduate distributed systems class, which is 677. So, that is how you should think of this class. Okay. So, it is a follow on to an undergrad class and it prepares you for an even more advanced course. Any questions so far? Okay. So, I will start with the definition of an OS. Okay. This is a slide that I taken directly from my undergrad OS class, because the definitions do not change from class to class is the same definition. Okay. So, what is an operating system? Okay. So, essentially it is the interface that sits between the user and the hardware or sits between the application and the uh, application processes and the hardware. Okay. Is the piece of software that runs when you power on your machine. Okay. Once you boot up your OS, it allows other processes to run on top of that operating system. Okay. So, so what an OS does is it essentially implements a virtual machine abstraction and I use the word virtual machine in a different sense from virtualization and other virtual machines you may actually touched here. It is a logical machine, it gives a logical view of what an underlying hardware looks like. Okay. So, when you interact with your machine, whether it is a laptop, desktop or your phone, okay, you do not actually need to worry about uh, what kind of processor is running on that machine how much RAM is on that machine, where your files are stored on disk. Okay. All of that is actually dealt by for you by the operating system. So, it is given you a much easier abstraction to work with. Okay. You work with files and file names, you do not worry about how the files are actually stored on disk. You can just start a process, you do not need to worry about where in memory that process is going to be loaded. Okay. You can start as many processes as you want and they will all run concurrently on your machine. All of that is done for you by the operating system. Okay. So, it is making it much easier for you to actually use your machine okay, by giving you that logical easier to use abstraction than actually dealing with raw hardware directly. Okay. So, that is a picture there that actually shows what I just said. So, you will see that there is hardware, there is an operating system that sits on top of the hardware and then there are applications that sit on top. Okay. So, essentially the OS manages the hardware. So, in some sense it is a resource manager, okay. it manages hardware resources, whether it is RAM, whether it is cores, whether it is disk storage space, all of that is actually managed by the OS. It decides how much of those resources are allocated to each application or process that is running on top. Okay. So, it is a resource manager. Okay. It also is a resource arbiter. Okay. If there are multiple competing applications running, it decides how much each application needs and gets. Okay. So, it is essentially trying to arbitrate access to underlying resources when there are competing demands from concurrent applications. Okay. So, so it is essentially think of it as a government that is going to make, make this uh, division of resources uh, across applications. Okay. 
Okay. So, there are many views of an OS, but you kind of get what an operating system is. Okay. Now, as a field, this is still an active area of research. Okay. Operating systems have been around since the late 1950s, okay. forever. Okay. As long as you have actually had computers, you have had operating systems that ran on them. Okay. But it is still an active area of research. Okay. Are people still developing new operating systems, they are still using them to do all kinds of things like designing cluster scheduling, designing cloud computing, designing embedded devices, wearable devices, all of these need operating system. Okay. So, you have OSs that run everything from your Fitbit to the cloud. Okay. So, there is a very vast spectrum of hardware, all of these actually require operating systems of different flavors. Okay. Everything from an embedded OS to a cluster operating system. Okay. Here, we are going to take a tiny peek at what is lies underneath. Okay, the answer will depend on what kind of hardware it is, what it requires and so on, but you will basically under start understanding what operating systems actually do under the hood. Okay. And the, the reason we can actually do all of this is because there is a vibrant open source movement that has actually uh, resulted in many different kinds of operating systems, okay, Linux being the most popular example, but there are many others as well. So, we will look at Minix, which is an open source operating system and we will look at Linux okay, and there are others like FreeBSD and many others that you can uh, use if you are interested. Okay. So, with that background, let me talk a little bit about an OS and an OS kernel. Okay, when I use the term operating system, you should say, what does that really mean? What part of the software that is running on my machine actually constitutes the OS? Okay. So, there is, uh, uh, there are different views about this. Right? So, the, the picture there, which I do not know if people in the back can read, actually shows you different layers and different parts of the st software stack. At the top are essentially users and the user application and then there are system libraries and then there is a system call interface as kernel device driver. So, there are different components that you actually have when you look at an operating system. So, where do we draw the boundary of what is an OS and what is an application process? Okay. Now, uh, as it turns out, the answer is not that simple as we will see. Okay. Now, you can uh, define the OS as being just the operating system kernel, which is a piece of software that boots up when you start your machine. Okay. That is the, the, that's essentially has the core functionality for doing all of this resource management that I talked about. And you can say everything that is not part of the kernel is not an OS, okay. but that is not really how uh, OS vendors actually see what an operating system is. They will actually have other layers that sit on top of the kernel that will still be considered part of an OS. Okay. And then we will see things get even more blurry when we talk about micro kernels, because there are many parts of the OS that just run as user processes. Okay. Your browser is going to be no different than some part of the OS that is running as user code. Okay. So, it is not really easy to define what is an OS and what is, what is part of the OS and what is not part of the OS. But for the purpose of this class, let us assume that the kernel, whatever is running in the kernel is definitely part of the OS. Okay. That is not a dispute. Okay. What is running outside the kernel may or may not be considered part of the OS, it depends on the platform. Okay. The picture that is shown here is referred to as a monolithic operating system, because everything that is important that needs to be part of the OS is part of the kernel. You just put everything of importance in the kernel. So, the OS is the kernel, there is nothing else that is an OS in this picture. Anything that is running outside the kernel is essentially assumed to be a user process. Okay. But let me show you some other pictures and you will see that the definition is not that clean. Okay. This is a picture that shows you the architecture of OS X, okay, the operating system that runs on a Mac. Okay. Picture is a bit dated, but it still gives you some sense of now what are all these layers. Because whatever I talked about was the kernel is essentially this piece at the bottom here. Okay. And you will see even in the kernel, there are actually two parts. There is actually a micro kernel and then there is a BSD that sits on top and then there is a Darwin layer that is a core OS and then there are core services. And as far as Apple is considered, con, uh, concerned, all of that is actually part of Mac OS X. They think that is the operating system, not just the kernel. Okay, system software is part of the OS from their perspective. Okay. Same is true of Windows. We look at the windows picture, not very different. There are lots of boxes. What is at the bottom, you will see is the kernel. Okay. 
So, there is Windows kernel services that just this layer, but as far as Microsoft is concerned, lots of these other things are also part of the OS. Okay. So, you will see that operating systems are fairly complex software systems. Okay. There is a core part of every operating system, which is the kernel. That is the one we are going to focus on by and large for the most part. Okay, but there are other pieces that may or may not even be part of the kernel that are still considered to be part of the operating system okay, that provide useful system level functionality. Okay. So, as a result, we are not going to adopt any strict definition of what is part of the OS and what is not, because the answer is, is going to depend on the platform. Okay. There is no one answer to that question. Okay, so, now, I will talk a little bit about other architecture. So, there is a layered, so that picture there shows you a layered approach to designing operating systems. Okay. So, I talked about the monolithic approach, which said that all OS functionality is going to be part of the OS kernel. Okay. Everything is inside the kernel. Okay. That is not necessarily a good way to design software systems. Your software becomes large and complex. If you want to make a tiny change to any part, it, there can be re, if, uh, rippling effects on other parts of that software system. Okay. So, as a result, operating systems have gone through some evolution, where you try to make their architecture more modular in some regard. Okay. The layered approach is essentially one way to do this, where you essentially layer software one on top of the other. Okay. So, the idea here is each component of your OS is going to be one layer and the layer is going to communicate to the layer above and below it. Okay. Now, having said that, then there is no operating system that actually uses this in its entirety, but there are parts of an OS that do use this concept. Okay. And the main uh, part of the OS that uses it is the network subsystem. The TCP IP layer that runs inside the OS essentially uses the layered approach because the TCP IP protocol itself is layered. Okay, if you take a networking class, you will know what I am talking about. If not, do not worry about it. That picture tells you what you need to understand as far as a layered OS is concerned. Okay. That is one approach to making things modular. Okay. Here is another approach. Okay. This is called the micro kernel approach. This is the one we are actually going to start with when we talk about Minix and the first lab assignment and so on. Okay. So, what happens in the micro kernel approach is, as the word micro kernel suggests to you, the kernel is very small and compact. Okay. It has bare bone functionality. Okay. It may do things like protection, so you cannot go, one process cannot go and trample on some other processes, memory and things of that sort. Okay. So, essentially it allows communication between processes, it allows for protection, so you can essentially have your memory and not give it, act, uh, have access to other processes maybe. Everything else is run outside the kernel, okay, as you can see here. Okay, so, you will see the micro kernel layer is fairly compact. Everything else that you even think is part of the OS actually is not part of the micro kernel itself. It runs as a separate user level process. Okay. Your file systems run as user level processes. Okay. Your process, your memory manager runs as a user level process, as you will see there is a paging system in there. Okay. Even things like the network protocol stack, all TCP IP processing is done by a user level process. Okay. All that the kernel is doing is allowing these processes to run, provide functionality to other user processes. Okay. That is the micro kernel way. Okay. We are going to go into a lot more detail. There is an entire class that I am lecture, I am going to devote to the micro kernel architecture, why it makes sense and so on. But what you can see now is that this is a different way of designing an OS from the monolithic architecture. Okay. Monolithic architecture said all of those things are part of one big process that boots up when you start your machine. That is all part of the kernel. Okay. Micro kernel architecture says make the kernel very compact. Okay, pull all the pieces out and run them as their own user level processes. Okay. So, so that is a very different approach for designing operating system. Okay. One could ask, why do th things this way? What did you gain by taking whatever was in a monolithic kernel and redesigning it in this fashion? And what did you lose by doing this? Yes, James. Did you gain it or lose it? 
Okay, so you lose efficiency. Can can somebody think about why you lose efficiency? Okay, communication over it. Okay, everything that if you put all those pieces inside one process, okay, each component can talk to another component through function calls. You just invoke a function, invoke a method, okay, which is very cheap. Okay, here they are user level processes. So if I have to talk to another OS process, you have to essentially send a message. Okay, messages will be order of mag orders of magnitude more expensive, slower than making a function call. So you are going to essentially have much higher overhead. There are lots of messages going back and forth. That is why IPC or process inter-process communication still has to be part of the microkernel because that is how all these components are going to talk to one another. Okay? So you lost speed and efficiency. Then why build microkernels? Yes. Okay, security. Can you elaborate what that means? Okay, so you get more security. Okay, and as you can see, if every function, functional, all core functionality of the OS have been made their own user level processes, you might get a more secure architecture. You might say, okay, maybe there is a bug in the file system. Okay? If I was a malicious hacker and I exploited that bug, I have gotten access to the file system. I can still do bad things to that machine, but I do not have access to the memory manager okay, because that is a different process. Okay. Now, if everything was part of one monolithic kernel, if I have one vulnerability and I exploit that vulnerability, I essentially get access to everything because everything is part of one process. Okay. If I partition it into separate processes, then I might take down something, but the rest of the system is not yet affected by it. Okay, you might still do bad things with it, but this, but doing it this way allows you to isolate problems to a process as opposed to making it system wide problem for uh, from a security standpoint. That clear? Okay. Yes. Question. Yes. Yes, that is a great point. So, the advantage that is being pointed out is one of software engineering. Okay. If you are actually going to be designing a large software system and everything is part of one big process, you might actually have to learn a lot of pieces in order to understand how the whole thing works and then you can start making changes. So, it is a big learning curve. Okay. There is also if you make changes, to the problem of you make changes to one component, how does that impact other components and so on. Okay. Here, if you want to build a new file system, you just need to know how that process is built and the interfaces to other processes, but you do not need to know how other OS processes are actually designed. You just need to know how they interact with one another. Okay. So, you from a software engineering perspective, from making it easier for users to learn about how to modify a kernel, how to build new components, it is a much better way of designing things. We will see another approach that also gives us that advantage in just a moment. Okay. But yes, there is good software engineering benefits to be had here as well. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments on this? Okay. So, as it turns out, uh, both Windows and OS X, which are two very popular operating systems, actually at one point both of them switched to a microkernel architecture. Okay. In fact, they are both derived from the same microkernel, which was the Mark microkernel. Okay. And then for a while they had a microkernel architecture. Okay. It was really slow. Okay. Users did not like having a very, very slow machine. Okay. So, then they decided that is not actually going to work from a user standpoint. So, they started taking pieces of the OS and putting it back into the kernel. Okay. So, most of these now have some sort of a hybrid architecture where parts of it are still microkernel and parts of it are not. Okay. And so, that is where the trade off comes in because this might be a great way to design systems, okay. but if your machine is going to be really, really slow, your users are not going to like using that at all. 
okay, because you cannot actually get their work done. So you have to now trade off user uh, uh, utility versus system efficiency and security. Okay, by putting things back, you are going back to the monolithic architecture. Okay, but it's going to have the, the the negative effect of actually reducing the security of your OS. Okay, that's something that you got with the microkernel architecture. Okay. So, as a result of this evolution, neither Windows or OS X actually use a microkernel architecture anymore. But at one point, they both actually thought this was a, a great way to build OS, and they both actually had a real microkernel architecture built into them. Okay, but not not anymore. So what? What are other ways of, uh, okay, so I actually mentioned all of this, so I am not going to repeat uh, the advantages, but what are some other ways of designing things? So, this is what I was talking about, which is the hybrid approach. Okay? So, you will see that in OS X, there is a layer at the bottom that is actually a microkernel. Okay? Everything else is supposed to be outside the microkernel, but you will see that they actually put the BSD layer as part of the microkernel because putting it outside the microkernel made things very slow. Okay? And then some of those other things are actually outside, but some of some of them have started making their way back in. Okay, if you go back to that picture I showed you, so you will see here that you still have the microkernel that is marked, but you can see some of those other things are actually being put back into the kernel. There are many things still run outside and no question, but there are lots of things that are now back in for efficiency reasons. So, it is a hybrid architecture that starts with the microkernel, but adds some components back while leaving some components outside the kernel. Okay. So, so, there are other ways to design operating systems. So, the people who designed, uh, designed monolithic kernels decided that they also needed a better approach, okay. but maybe microkernels was not the only way. There were other ways to do it. So, they said, how can we make our system more modular? Okay. So, they came up with this concept of OS modules. Okay. So, what happens, we have a picture here that can be useful in explaining. So, what happens in a modular OS is you have a kernel. It is not a micro kernel, but it is essentially a compact kernel that you boot up. Okay. And then lot of the OS functionality is built as optional modules that get loaded on demand. Okay. If you need it, you load it. Otherwise, you leave it out. Okay. And the good way, news is each module has the same software engineering benefits as designing a component of a micro kernel. Okay. You, so long as you adhere to well defined interfaces, you can work on your module without worrying about what else is in the OS. You do not need to learn the whole OS to build a module. Okay. So, though this makes the architecture more modular. Okay. However, when you boot up your OS, everything becomes part of one address space. So, it looks when you are at runtime, it looks like a monolithic kernel because everything is in one process. Okay. From, but from a design perspective, you can essentially build pieces of the OS as independent modules okay, that can then get loaded as and when you need them. Okay. So, all file systems for example, are designed as modules that you boot up when you need them in most of these modular operating systems. You can support multiple file systems, you can plug in as, as many as you need depending on what hardware exists on your machine. So, you do not get the security benefits of micro kernels, okay. because modules are part of one address space. It, when you boot up, it essentially looks like one big process. It does not look like n processes plus a micro kernel, okay. but you get the efficiency, because now everything is part of one address space, okay. same as what you had in the monolithic architecture. So, things are going to be efficient. They are not going to require lots of messages going back and forth and things of that sort. Okay. Uh, and you also get the software engineering benefits, because all you need to know is how to write an OS module, and then you can essentially write a piece of the OS without having to worry about how you do it, how you, uh, what, what the rest of the OS does. Okay. So, as part of this lab, one of these labs, you are going to write an OS module without actually knowing anything about what is else is in the OS. And you will see what some of these benefits actually mean. Yes, your question. So, from a 
Yeah. Question is from a security standpoint, is it as vulnerable as a monolithic kernel? The answer is yes, because if there is a vulnerability in one module and you exploit that vulnerability, you get access to the entire kernel, because it is part of one address space. All of the memory of that kernel, all of the code becomes part of uh, what you get access to. So, yes, there is no, no better security benefits than the monolithic architecture, it is the same in that regard. Any other questions here? Uh, yes. What makes the kernel monolithic? What makes the kernel monolithic? Okay. So, that is a good question. So, now that picture might make it look like each of those, so the, uh, the what is at the middle is essentially the kernel and all these blue bubbles are essentially modules. Okay. But these are not independent processes unlike a micro kernel. Okay. So, in the micro kernel, you can see these processes, the thread system and the file system, those are actual user level processes, okay. they are separate from the OS altogether. Okay. Now, in a modular architecture that you see here, okay, these pieces are actually going to be loaded, they just become part of the OS when you boot up. Okay. So, it is a monolithic process not a monolithic architecture, meaning it is a single process. Monolithic in just means it is one pro OS process when it boots up. Okay. So, all of those things will be inside that one process, but from architecture standpoint, they are independent modules that are going to get loaded. Okay. Other questions here? Yes. Question about micro kernels. How is it a good idea to, uh, make, to give memory management user level access? Okay. Good, good question. The question is, uh, how can, first of all, why is it a good idea or how can you even make memory management a user level process, right. So, so I think we will go into uh, micro kernel design in two or three lectures from now, okay. Now, so the question is what, what does it mean to make memory management a user level process? So, what does a memory manager do, okay? When a process starts up, memory manager says, this is where this process is going to run in RAM, okay. this is how much memory I am going to allocate to it, okay. I might be doing paging. So, all of those details are handled by the memory manager. Okay. Now, this memory manager has to do the same thing, okay. except that it might actually need access to low level hardware that is responsible for memory management. Typically, there are special instructions on the CPU that are reserved for kernel use only. User processes cannot actually invoke those because they, they do sensitive memory management operations. If you let user processes muck around with them, then you are not going to have any security. You can get access to any processes memory. Okay. So, so, all you need is a way by which you can actually do all of those things in a user space, but so long as that memory manager has access to this uh, in CPU instructions that allows them to make changes. So, whenever a new process runs, it can load new page tables and get access to registers and save them and restore them and things of that. So, long as, so long as you can do that, it is fine to actually put that functionality in a user level process. You do not lose anything. There is no need to actually put it inside the kernel. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. So, question is if it is a user level process, it is more prone to security. Not quite. User level process does not mean users go and write that code. Kernel developers have written the code and tested it and what not. So, the assumption is that code has been written by people who actually design OS kernels, they have tested it and so on. So, it is not expected that it will be as buggy as somebody just wrote a C program and or Python code and loaded it and it has 10 bucks. So, that is not the expectation. So, so, it is going to be well designed. Okay. So, that is not the problem. I mean, you could ask why should you do this in user space at all? Why should you have a file system running in user space? Okay. Why is that not part of the kernel? Okay. That is a different design discussion. We will have that discussion in uh, two or three classes. In fact, you will write a user space file system by the time we are done with the course. Yes, question. I, I guess this is not the same uh, page. I, I guess to me the question you got asked is what does it mean? Because if you, if memory management is a user level process, couldn't somebody else make a user level process that accesses those same restrictions followed by no problem? Yes. So, 
that is a good point. So, question is if I can write my own memory manager and it can get access, can it get access or sensitive. So, these are all interesting design questions of how do you write a microkernel so that it knows what is part of a system level process and what is a user level. You could ask the same thing of a file system, right. File systems are in user space. Can I not write my own file system that goes and accesses all the files on disk? So, now I can access any user's process because what is going to prevent the OS from accepting my file system request for some data on disk versus an actual file system data. So, how do you do this in a secure way is an important deci design decision. We will see how to get to that. Yes. Well, the user there. So, every by user process we simply mean is not part of the kernel, but that does not mean that any user process can do whatever it wants by accessing system services. System level processes will still have some more privileges than user level processes. Yes, exactly, but it is just not part of the kernel that is what we meant. Okay. Any other question? So, these are good dis dis uh, discussion questions and we will see how to do that when we get to micro kernels. How do you distinguish between a vanilla user process and a system level process that is running in user space? Any other questions? Yes. Uh, does, uh, do the system level processes that are running outside micro kernel uh, access the hardware directly or do they make it to some, mod, uh, some part of micro kernel? Okay. Question is do uh, parts of the micro kernel that run in user space access hardware directly? So, no user level process actually gets direct access to hardware, okay. you have to go through the micro kernel. Okay. So, micro kernel is still going to arbitrate access to hardware at some level, otherwise you are going to have no security left at some level. Okay. So, that is the job of the micro kernel to essentially have protection, have provide access to really low level resources to have inter process communication, that is all you do in the micro, everything else is outside the kernel. Okay. Any other question? That is actually the last slide for today because this was just a quick introduction. We are going to end the class maybe 20 minutes early unless you have other questions. Okay. Now, uh, before you all leave, if the, some of you are here but not registered for the class, please come see me. So, we can figure out how to get you in assuming we have seats for everyone. Uh, and uh, also, if you have any concerns about your background of C or operating systems, come talk to me as well. Okay. Yes. Okay. Question. Yeah, they are team projects. I will announce that. Yes. Groups of two. Everything is groups of two. You can do them by yourself, but you are allowed to have a group.